starting and managing a facilitator, a master facilitator team. So let's get into it, shall we? Uh, what's our objectives? Well, a few things we're trying to do. We want to share best practice for how do you get approval and funding? How do you attract, develop facilitators? How do you make sure you attract internal customers and get results? Also, a time for you to get answers to some of your questions and then learn about what InnoFact does and how InnoFact can support you in this effort. So if you would, it'd be great uh, that any uh, questions you have at the end of this, if you'd hold on to those questions, because we certainly would like to hear from you. And a copy of these slides, if you answer the poll at the end of the session, you also will receive a copy of these slides. So jumping in, concerning questions, if you have a question, you have a few options. You can type it into the question panel, click on raise your hand, and we'll have limited time to uh, available to answer questions, but that'd be great. And then from time to time, we're actually going to have a poll for you. Speaking of timing, we only have 55 minutes, or actually 53 minutes now, so we have five major questions we're going to cover. And that means there's about eight minutes per question once we get past the opening and the close, which means about two minutes per panelist. And so I'm going to have to ask you, please be nice to me, because I'm going to be using a timer. And the panelists have agreed to abide by it, and so it just means it's going to feel a little rushed. But after this, we're going to talk about how we can follow up and go deeper. So let's go to poll number one, if you would. So in poll number one, I'm adding that first poll. We're asking, in terms of group facilitation, which of these categories apply to you? So we're opening that first poll. And if you would answer that first poll, that would be great. Is it you manage a group of internal facilitators? And you're asking to check one that most applies to you. I am an internal facilitator. I manage a group of externals. I am an external. Or I do not do group facilitation. So if you would pick the one that most applies to you, that would be great. And uh, Brad, I'm going to mute you for just, if you would go ahead and mute yourself for just a second, Brad, because we're having a little background noise there. All right, so we are rocking and rolling. We've got about 50% responding on the call. We're up to 60. All right, great. Well, let's just take a look at uh, what the responses to the poll were. So we had some interesting, interesting groups as we close. So let's go ahead and close that poll and go ahead and share the results. 24% of those involved actually manage. 50% are internal facilitators. We have 7% uh, managing a group facilitation, 14% who actually, and in 5%, they do not do group facilitation. So there are over 50 people on the call at this point. Uh, involved in so you can get a feel for who actually is involved in this and so really if you take a look at the 24 and the 50 the 74 percent we really at this point are really targeting our comments for you but we appreciate everyone being involved in this so let's go ahead and hide those slides and let's get into our agenda what's our agenda for the session so first i'm going to go through the members of the panel so you know who's on what's a master facilitation team and why actually do it how do you get approval and funded? How do you attract and develop facilitators? How do you attract internal clients? And then we'll be ending with the last five minutes just talking about what the International Institute for Facilitation does to support master facilitator teams. We expect to have five minutes for Q&A. We want to remind you, think of this as just an introduction. Because we would, in effect, we'd like to be, this to be the start of a community of practice where we're learning from one another and get together, we get together, we would get together per periodically with this just being the starting point. So with your interest and continued interest, we welcome uh, your participation as we go, as we go deeper into the questions that in this 50 minutes, 55 minutes, we'll just be touching on. But let's get to the panel and let's go through introductions quickly. And so I'm going to ask panelists, would you wave when your no name comes up? And I want to let folks know that we have, um, we can only show six videos at a time, so you'll be seeing faces go off and come back on as we're rolling through to make room for the eight. So let me start with Brad. Would you wave your hand, please, for me? Thank you, Brad. So we take a look at Brad. We'll see that Brad has very, very specific comes to us. He's, um, his, the role he's been playing is uh, in his role at uh, Technic FMC, a recent merger. He's facilitation manager of the in-house. It's been going for two years. And they do all kinds of things, as you see there, from process mapping to global virtual events. Corey, would you wave your hand for us, please? So Corey's at Autodesk. 
and manages innovation and technology. Their team is a little more informal, going for about 18 months, and they facilitate internal teams on a variety of things, including strategy with the C staff, which is wonderful, as well as working with end users. Eric, hand wave Eric. There we go. Eric's Vice President of Strategy Management at Haggerty's. So he works collaboratively with other executives, as you can see, uh, both envisioning, mission, vision, and other things. And he facilitates strategy as well. That takes us to Jerry. Jeremy, at, uh, would you wave? Yes, Madison College. And uh, Jerry and I were together recently at the IAF conference in West Palm Beach. And so you can see that they have an interest-based problem-solving problem solving unit, which is great name coming out of a, a university academic setting. So they've got 25 in-house facilitators that have been trained, and they've been going since 2014. So one of the more um, veteran groups as well. Let's go on. Laura, would you wave your hand, please? Yes, there's Laura um, from National Nederlanden. And she manages their internal workshop center. So she not only manages it, she was the founder of it. And so she does the training of the internal facilitators and manages the pool. Thank you, Laura. Now, Paulette from Cigna. Paulette, is, uh, we, we don't have her on at this point on video. Uh, but Paulette, right. can you hear us? Yes, great. But she'll yes, be I can hear with you. her responses. And so you can see that she is uh, the, a member of their central operating effectiveness team. And they've got over uh, close to 100 professionals, and they're upskilling their team to be effective facilitators. Appreciate that, Paulette. And Preeti, would you wave, please? Oh, Preeti's not with us yet. And so if you're on board, if you're, so we may, um, Preeti may not be involved in our discussion, but uh, he has 11 plus years as L&D. And then finally, Tina from North Carolina State University, uh, Organization and Development Manager. Thank you, thank you. Um, five consultants in her team, and they do much on the organizational effectiveness side, including strategy development, leadership development, and so on. So as you can see, a very veteran team here to answer questions and provide insights. So thank you for that team. So let's rock into that very first question, which has to do with the master facilitator team and why have one. So let's rock into that question. So first of all, what do we mean by a master facilitator team? So here's the definition we're using at in effect. A team is a group of two or more highly skilled facilitators who support the organization and other facilitators in three ways. One, group facilitation services. So they provide that to the organization. Two, development opportunities. So it's a place that you grab, you can gain development. And then a community of practice to promote continuous learning. Those are the key things that it does. But I'd like to hear from you, those uh, uh, who are uh, involved in the call, why have a master facilitator team? Let's take a look at what the purpose is there that you would see. Would you, in the question box, answer the question why you would see, and I'll read three or four of those as we're going, but why have a master facilitation team? So I'd love to get your thoughts on that. If you would go ahead and type them in the question box, We'll give it a minute as we're getting answers on that. And so we're looking for why would you? What's the purpose of having a master facilitator team? Chris speaks to it gives you subject matter experts. Absolutely. That's a nice way where you get people who are actually skilled in doing the work showing other people. Thank Chris. Thank you, Chris. Other comments? Uh, Debbie mentions that you can get consistency and continuity, both consistency in sessions and so on. Eileen mentioned you get a pool of qualified resources. Uh, Dimitri says facilitation is an integral part, and there's Six Sigma. Frank put it down. It's all about ROI. You can reduce wasted time. Julia talks about spending money on bringing people in to do this work, but it becomes cost savings. Cynthia mentioned consistency, and we'll take these last two. Roy mentioned leveraging talents, and Charles says spreading out facilitation best practices throughout the organization of really nice ways to make sure that we are using and implementing and maximizing the resources of an organization. So we're going to save those responses, by the way, but let's hear from our panel in terms of what they found. And on this first question, um, Eric, Jeremy, Laura, and Tina, would you take the question, what's the size of your team, 
and why and how it gets sta- it got started. And just a reminder, you're on the two minute clock. Eric, you are first up, please. Would you take us there? Go for it, Eric. And Eric, if you're speaking, I apologize. We can't yep. hear you. With you on the- there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Go for it, Eric. We'll restart that clock <laughs> All for right. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I think uh, the size of our team, we have about 16 and it's volunteers. Um, it's people that, and I'll get into that in a, a little bit, but the reason and why we got started, we did an internal uh, study around efficiency. And we came up with a list, as you can imagine, uh, very substantial, but interesting to me as, as, as a single internal facilitator is that meeting was number two on that list. And wow. so I saw an opportunity, I saw an opportunity there, uh, of course, and people liked the meetings that I ran. Um, they ran better, and I said, well, this is ridiculous. Why don't we teach more people how to become facilitators? So that's really how it got started. Nice. Nice. We'll keep going. Thank you. So your, it was your yeah. idea of getting it started by doing that. Right. Well, you are yeah. up, Jeremy, please. Jeremy, your right. thoughts. Thanks, Michael. Uh, We have a pool actually at Madison Area Technical College of over 100 in-house trained facilitators, of which approximately 25, as Michael mentioned previously, actively facilitate projects sponsored through my office. Other facilitators may be facilitating in their own areas, taking on the knowledge they learn from our in-house training and putting it to use to run more effective meetings and are facilitating projects without the support of the office. So similar to what Eric had uh, mentioned uh, previously. We started training facilitators actually back in 2014 in response to our college's adoption of a shared governance approach to decision making. Our first facilitators were trained to facilitate the eight different councils that tackled a wide variety of college-wide issues utilizing an interest-based approach. As the benefits of utilizing this type of approach became more widely known, various departments throughout the college began requesting facilitators for projects that were of importance to their own areas. The facilitation team continued to grow as the number of project requests continued to increase. and We saw a 73% jump in the number of projects we facilitated over the past year. So we've also established a facilitator learning community and provided the opportunities for facilitators to attend workshops and trainings outside the organization to learn more about facilitation techniques and strategies. I feel it's important for facilitators to be able to share their successes and have a support network for discussing challenges, especially since our facilitators often work on projects in isolation in addition to their other full-time responsibilities. Not only do we connect as a learning community internally, but we are also partners with a learning community hosted by the UW-Madison called Focus on Facilitation. Both internally and externally, our facilitators have learned new techniques through these learning communities, but have also built connections that they can lean on for support and guidance. At a minimum, they report how re-energizing it can be to simply be in a room of facilitators where they can simply listen, but also, if desired, practice new strategies in a low-stakes environment where they can get feedback for further growth. And I'll yield back my last five seconds. Five seconds. You are good. (laughs) (laughs) Impressive. And so I just want to say, Jeremy, it's really clear, isn't it, that you all have done an amazing job of building a community of practice. But here's the kicker. You started with the shared governance approach that because that was accepted by the organization, it seems like that provided the vehicle for you to leverage it and move forward and grow very quickly. Very impressive. Well, too. Well, let's jump to Laura. Laura, please, if you would. What's the size and why and how did you get started? Yeah, I have to talk a little bit in the past because I'm no longer involved in National and Nade London. I'm an agile coach now in a different company. Um, so I'm talking about 2008 when we started an internal workshop center at National and Nade London, a master team. And it was by the IT sponsor, the IT director, who was very inspired by Cap Gemini, who had an accelerator to uh, speed up the IT development processes. So it was actually before the Agile Scrum Hype that they started doing uh, sessions for us to accelerate the IT development. But um, at a certain point of time, it became quite expensive to do that all externally. So this IT director moved it in-house. And that's uh, where I had a chance to jump in as an internal facilitator. And it started to grow. It started with IT, but then the marketing department came along and wants to do marketing strategy, innovation, uh, trainee days. So at a certain point, it moved from IT to HR service department, and it could grow. 
And um, when I left the company, we had a team of 10 internal facilitators and more or less 10 external facilitators. So I had like an inner circle and outer circle working together and building a community together. Um, yeah, and I think the big advantage of having an internal master facilitation center is that um, it makes it uh, reachable for a really big group. Uh, because if you have to go outside, you need out of, you need you have out of pocket costs. Uh, you need a lot of administration to do the contracting. Uh, you have to find a facilitator that's suitable. It takes time to explain to the facilitator what you want. So the process is more efficient and uh, and I think of more effectively uh, besides that you have all the side effects that the facilitators learn and develop themselves um, okay so that's it <laughs> and the hand clap says and yeah. thank you for that and we picked up three things already then so while Eric talked about better meetings was the really the, the source the driver and Jeremy talked about the shared governance approach I heard from you while it started with IT development it rolled into HR and other areas let's hear from mm -hmm. Tina Tina what size and why and how did you get started good afternoon Michael um, we are right now as part of your human resources division a total of five facilitators and we started out really linking it to the learning and development needs um, probably more traditionally what you see with team development uh, probably about 12 years ago when I first started here. As we've continued to deliver those services and work with our campus community, we've seen it grown into a much larger scale requests uh, that include you know, facilitating strategic planning efforts across the campus and the community, um, the facilitation and design of a campus-wide IT strategic planning process to leading and designing and leading events that involve gathering um, data or pulling together individuals, faculty, staff, industry experts around big data. So we've seen that work expand and grow. The, the real value <clears throat> that we see that this um, has grown to, we see an opportunity with, is continue to enhance the work that we do at this institution, the um, work and efficiencies and the productivity of the team, but also having the impact on the culture and the climate in our institution. How do we engage individuals at our campus to create this community of learning? And, and I see facilitation as a key component to that. Um, we initially started out as a small team. We've grown. We've added a new position this last year. And so the organizational development function, which is where primarily the facilitation falls under, grew out of this um, continuing demand and need that we're seeing. And all of our facilitators have are experienced and have significant background in doing this work. I'm, I'm very intrigued by um, Jeremy's work that he's doing at Madison College as well, because we do see that the next stage is to grow that capacity and build that in the learning and development of leaders at our well, well, nice shout out to Jeremy. Jeremy, we'll be looking for you to tell us all how to do that. And again, underschooling, we've heard four different reasons for why these groups were started. So thank you for that. And let's move on then based on that to our next topic and we're ready to kick in. So now that we've talked about why have it, how do you get it approved and funded? Because that's where the rubber meets the road. We all, every organization has scarce resources. So we have to be doing something that's going to get them to say, let's get this approved. So let's go to the panel again, and we've got uh, really uh, two questions in particular. Um, what does your team do, and how do you get it approved and funded? And Paulette, I know you're not on the screen, but can we get started with you in terms of your team and how, what you do and how do you get it funded? Absolutely. So our team uh, helps to lead the operating effectiveness for Cigna, for the company, and we work cross-functionally in doing that. And so. Uh, by, by just sheer default of looking at how we make our uh, processes more efficient and effective, we also have to look at ourselves and how do we do our work and how do we become more effective um, in what we're doing. And one of the things that we realize is that, you know, we constantly look at upskilling our employees and what is it that they need as far as development in order to be better process engineers, better knowledge engineers, better change managers. Um, 
And in one of those things was definitely looking at how are we facilitating meetings and are we using the best um, ways in doing that. And so we actually um, used to just, we um, gathered our funding through our learning and development budget. Um, we used it as part of that in the beginning, started with a small group, said that, hey, let's give it a try and see how it works. And it proved to be so successful, as Michael mentioned before, we now have close to 100 people as a part of our master facilitation team. Excellent. Well said. Thank you for that. And we'll keep going. Tina, you are up. Yeah. Tina, if you're right. speaking, Sorry, with you, there you go. There we go. So our, our program is actually funded through uh, resources that come from state appropriated funds. The positions themselves are funded that way. Uh, as we grow and as we've grown and developed our services, we actually have received funds through chargeback. We use a chargeback process to the cost wow. center on our campus. So depending on the nature of the work, we start with a statement of work and outline the objectives and how we're going to meet those objectives for the client. Uh, our work, like I said before, can vary anywhere from a team facilitation to a large group uh, facilitation, but it's often focused on what is, how do we help the colleges and the departments on our campus achieve their business needs, their organizational needs, and align it directly with those objectives. Nice. Thank you. And it's interesting because you may be one of the few that actually use the chargeback mechanism, but we'll hear more. Corey, you're up, sir. Hello. Um, yeah, so we've taken uh, a lot of a very grassroots approach to how we do things. So um, where there are people who've been very motivated in the past through their design practice and other um, customer engagements, they've shown the value of facilitation, and we've started to roll that out to more people. Um, we do a similar thing to Tina where with training, uh, we actually charge uh, different groups for the training just to make sure that people are really have skin in the game and they're on board with uh, what they're signing up for. A lot of times the organization is paying for it because it directly impacts their job in terms of uh, how they're uh, interacting with customers. That's our, our primary focus is the customer facing side of things. So from our uh, sales org to our design orgs that are um, building software and tools. So we really want to make sure that it's um, Everything we're doing is on track and we're making the most of everyone's time when we're doing these things. Um, a lot of the funding in this grassroots mode comes from a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. So we'll have people um, who will trade off, I'll facilitate for you this week, you can facilitate for me next month or whatever it is. Um, yeah, and so I think that I think that's the, uh, the key points here for us on that one. Excellent. So you've got both the charging for the training as well as the <laughs> yeah, the exchange of services, which uh, which works. All right. And Laura, yes, go Laura. Hi there. Yeah, this this was not my favorite subject, and uh, it is also because uh, because of um, discussions on budget and funding, it was also the ending of our uh, internal workshop center. It started pretty well with the IT director, who was a big sponsor. And uh, at that time, we could really show that the lead time for requirement sessions was uh, becoming um, becoming less. So we had quite a business case. But when we started doing more uh, team building sessions and creativity, innovation sessions, um, it was harder to show the benefits in terms of money. Um, and as long as there was a central budget, everybody was okay and, and really wanting to use us. But then the discussion started, um, maybe the users should pay for each session themselves. And, um, and that's where I think the hard part is because in a lot of sessions, we're sitting down together because there's not just one person or department having a problem. We're sitting together because we have problems in collaboration or in the chain or in the complexity that we're working in. So who are you gonna, um, uh, who, who's gonna pay the bill for solving that issue? So it really interfered in a way of working in the center and finally nobody said, okay, I will pay uh, for, all, for all of you and then uh, they closed it down and now they are outsourcing it again. So um, yeah, budgeting is and funding is a really important subject and my lesson is that the best way to solve this is to get a sponsor 
and make the sponsor also a believer. So really include him in what you're doing and give him experiences in good facilitated sessions and then he will uh, take care of that. Having an executive sponsor critical, and if you're not yeah. charging back, if you don't have funding, that can be a real issue. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, and I think we are uh, we are ready for our second poll here as we go forward. So let's go there, because now we're talking about. So we've moved to getting started and from getting started and getting funded. Now it says, okay, let's get into the internal working. How do you get the team? How do you attract the team? And how do you develop facilitators? and love to ask this question in the form of a poll. So let's go ahead and put that poll up, shall we? And so if you were responsible, if you were responsible for the development of a facilitation team, which of these strategies would you use? And you can go ahead and check all that apply. Um, so no need to read through each one. Which strategies would you use? So the poll is in progress now. We'll give it another 20 seconds as you're, um, as you're voting. So the question is, which of these strategies would you use? We've got 20% voting. Let's go ahead and we'll finish that up. We'll give it another 20 seconds. So would you use a facilitator competency model? Would you provide team members with training? Would you view team members facilitating? Would you develop improvement plans? Would you promote certification? So closing in five, four, Three, two, and one. Let's go ahead and close that out. We had 75% voting on this. Let's take a look. Well, good news. All of the tools were tools that people would use. The one was that was um, by far the highest, 79%, was providing team with training. Then 74% develop and monitor improvement plans. And you see others, the use of a competency model and viewing the team and then promoting certification. So all different tools that could be used. And let's take a look at, from our panelists, what have they actually done of these strategies or strategies of their own? Let's hear from the panel. There are a couple of questions we want to focus on. First, how do you go about attracting? And two, what do you do for continuous development? And you see the order there. Preeti's not with us, so we'll go Jeremy, Brad, Eric. Jeremy, you are on the clock, please. Let's go ahead. Jeremy, you are right. up if you're talking. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Gotcha, you bet. So as far as, far as attracting facilitators, we started simply by asking college leaders if they or someone they know uh, or knew would be interested in receiving training and facilitation. It was primarily presented to them as professional development with no real strong expectation that they would become a member of a facilitator team. About 90% of the people we've trained, however, have put their training into practice either in their own department or unit or for, um, or for uh, projects supported by my office or actually both. As of late, we've relied more on people who have been participants in one of the projects we facilitate to either self-select or to be nominated by the facilitator of that particular project. As far as developing our facilitators, we have monthly facilitator learning community meetings where we typically take time to share one new facilitation idea or strategy, and then have facilitated discussions about facilitation successes, opportunities for growth, questions, and so on. We have several of our learning community members volunteer to facilitate these conversations, so not only are they participants, but also facilitators during these gatherings. I've also sent teams of our more active facilitators to different facilitation trainings or workshops across the area. Those are all based in uh, specific competencies associated with those organizations, obviously. They unselfishly bring back the knowledge they've gained and share it in newly designed in-house trainings or workshops and or at our monthly learning community gatherings. We also have an internal clearinghouse where our facilitators can upload artifacts of facilitation experiences, so for example, agendas, photos, participant feedback along with a detailed reflection of how the artifact shows accomplishments aligned with the International Association of Facilitator Competencies. We review each of those submissions, and as facilitators reach specific milestones, they can earn badges, which can be shared not only internally, but also externally on sites such as LinkedIn. Nicely done. Love it. Let's keep going then. Some nice tools you're using. Brad, you're up, sir. All right, so what have we done? Uh, so we built our facilitation team, uh, our fabulous facilitation team, two years ago uh, and could only get two people. And we went, like if you hire normally now, probably through an internal network. So we found two people, Charles and Elaine, 
who did it already as part of their existing job somewhere else, Charles from Business Excellence and Elaine from our university. Uh, but we support an organization where Team of Three supports an organization of 45,000 employees globally. And we can't hire. So what we do is we build a community of practice. So we have an online community of practice that we have for our organization with over 130 members that practice facilitation or do some kind of facilitation in their jobs. And so we connect everybody through, through that method. And then to keep developing people, we developed our own internal facilitation training workshop. Uh, we've done our research. We, we know what's going to resonate within our organization. Uh, the parts uh, and the things that we've done and, and, and have really internalized, we've put into a two-day training class that we offer on a semi-regular basis here. We're in the process of creating a virtual version as well. Uh, that way, people learn and, and, and see, well, we see uh, facilitation as a professional skill that everyone should have. Uh, and even though we're the only ones that do it full time, they can make an impact and reach the crowds that we simply can't reach to. Uh, the three of us are based here in Houston, but we have the vast majority of our company is not in Houston, and no one's paying for travel right now in the oil and gas market. So uh, anyway, so we take advantage of this, and we're building a virtual army of facilitators, training them uh, to, to go out and 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 be our our hands and feet someplace else. Well, nicely done, and I suspect, I suspect the, the facilitation training is making a difference, and having it internal can certainly help. Preeti, I see you're on the line. Can we go with you next? Thank you. Sure, yes. So with the first question that how do we go about attracting the facilitation team, so I'd like to give you a little bit of a background to, you know, how we went about setting up the entire facilitation team. So I come from Dale Carnegie and I was hired with the GE Money SBI card to actually set up the entire learning and development team from scratch. So practically there was nothing in place when I moved into this role. So it was a one-man army. Uh, how I went about building my team is, uh, you know, I partnered with the training and quality team. So we kind of, you know, launched a facilitator upskilling certification program, which was mapped to nine core competencies that we had identified. And we kind of panel of 12 uh, trainers from the training and quality team and handpicked uh, the top five, you know. So we had a teach back model where each one of them came and delivered a module of about 30 minutes. They were, uh, you know, assessed uh, around the nine competencies and we picked up five people who we felt were ready to go on the floor and deliver. Uh, so today we have a team of 10 facilitators which uh, which is actually about five facilitators from the training and quality team and that apart we also leveraged business facilitators where we went about seeking nominations from business leaders who would be keen to facilitate. They went through our facilitators upskilling program uh, around the nine core competencies. As for continuous development, it's one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, creating individual developmental plans when they give the teach back, followed by one-on-one -on -one coaching, tandem trainings, uh, shadowing facilitators, having a senior facilitator sit through the session and give them feedback after the session, and a facilitator's upskilling community, which we've set up on our intranet. So these are things that we need to continuously develop our facilitators. Thank you. Well, well said, and thank you for that. A lot of information. I love it. Ten facilitators doing the work and developing it from scratch. Lots of applause to you. There are a couple of people who have founded their teams who are on the panel. Eric, close us out if you would, please. Give us your view of how do you attract and how do you develop. Well, I think I think the panel's offered some some really great suggestions, and some of them that that I've certainly included. I want one that's a little bit different, however, is that actually setting the example as a facilitator within your organization. Uh, mm. I think I'm a pretty good facilitator. Uh, Michael, I, you know, I've been in your class. I don't think I'm great yet. But just the mere <laughs> fact of having people see good facilitation makes them interested. And, they, and, the, and I think everybody wants to improve themselves. I have that faith in humanity that we, people will just want to do better naturally. And so they want to learn. And so one of the ways you do that is to start to establish relationships across the organization. And you can actually kind of start to spot talent. I, I was actually looking for that. Um, 
And what I did is I went out to the business leaders uh, and asked them, uh, I told them what I wanted to do, that I wanted to create a cadre of facilitators. Um, and if they had people in their department, volunteer only, now I have no budget, um, would they be interested in, in having someone in their department? My only criteria was that they could put them in a C-level meeting and they'd be comfortable with that. And nice with criteria. that, I, and I got, I, and I received uh, vice president levels, attorneys, all kinds of people. I was just overwhelmed with the quality of people that I got to join this group. Uh, in terms of their continuous development, you have to realize I'm just getting started in this. Um, so we are doing this, I'm kind of following an old school Toastmasters model. In other words, we're gathering, we're working on some basic skills, trying those skills out, coming back together, and sharing what we've learned. And I've, but I've dangled the idea of more professional training in front of them, and actually the idea of longer range of vision of developing, actually getting certified, which they seem to be kind of excited about. So, very nicely done. And love the idea of just the whole idea of using that criteria of someone who they'd be willing to put into a C-level meeting. That, I mean, that cuts to the chase because you could talk about a lot of skills, but all of a sudden that draws a nice image. Well, thank you, right. team. Let's rock on, shall we? Let's rock on. And so we've talked now about getting attracted and developing facilitators. Now it's time for the rubber to meet the road, isn't it? Because we can have all this talent all these people, all this capability, but if you're not doing the work and you're not showing results from doing the work, more than likely when, when budget crunch comes, when the economy downturns, we're going to have trouble justifying our existence. So let's get to the core question then is, all right, we have this capability. How do we attract clients? How do we show results? And again, from the panel, we've got those two questions. How do you attract and how do you document results? And again, we're going to go to Brad, Corey, uh, Paulette, and Preeti to this. So let's go ahead and get me started. Brad, thank you. You bet. So for us, it's like uh, we're our own internal consultancy. And if you ever start your own business, uh, you really kind of use your internal network to get your first clients. As a lot of us have used that network to help identify uh, where we can best serve. Uh, we're also cross-functional within our knowledge management group. So we work hand-in-hand -hand with a, uh, a knowledge solutions team, a collaboration team that manages networks, a multimedia team, and, and an internal wiki team that handles our, our wiki. Uh, and so we all understand and know each other's parts of uh, the business. And as we talk with our internal customers, we look for opportunity to upsell and cross-sell, for lack of a better word. So we get brought in on other opportunities that, that our peers are working on. Uh, we've even made videos that we're able to push out internally to show uh, the kind of work that we do. And as we finish engagements with our internal customers, we get quotes that we then put on an internal website that we maintain that has a portfolio of the different projects we've worked on. Uh, we've also compiled an internal survey. So last year we did a survey about meetings and people's attitudes and feelings on meetings within our company and came up with a number, uh, some, some actual dollar amounts. So we found out that as a company, uh, we waste $2.6 million per week in bad wow. meetings, in effective meetings. Wow. So that gives us a goal of something we can start chunking away at and, and show some results year after year. So our goal is to do that again and see how we're doing. And even pare that down and look at, it, at businesses. You know, do we want to uh, narrow that scope? So. And it's part of our process now is as we engage people and do their uh, and do the initial preparation, we want to ask them what's the outcome, what's the impact, what are you trying to do, uh, and then whatever their results are our results. You know, their successes are our successes, and, and that's how we document. Nicely done, Brad. We love it. If there's a way that you could sanitize that report. Uh, to take out your company's name, because I have a feeling your company would not be interested. In. <laughs> but if there's a way, I think a lot of us could benefit from being able to say, one large corporate organization doc division of cut, documented their meetings and found this. That would be just an ask, if you will, if you happen to be able to do that. I will see what I can do, Michael. All right. I know what that means. <laughs> well, I, I need to ask the right people. I need to ask the right people. That's right. Uh, Corey, you're up, sir. 
Okay. Um, yeah, we do a bunch of those things that Brad says, so I won't uh, cover too many of them. But for us, having the internal community is super important. We have local meetups at different offices uh, just to keep people aware of what's going on and share the results. Um, we keep a lot of metrics. One that's really hard to sort of pin down but is, is very clear for people is just that people say they are more engaged in meetings. Meetings are more fun uh, when we run them with uh, good facilitation. Uh, I think I think for us a couple things to add on what Brad said is that we uh, do a lot of sessions both internally and externally and uh, some of those external ones tend to be in very uh, public places. So every year we run a, an event called Autodesk University. And so we have about 10,000 customers coming together with our employees and um, working on different wow. things. And so we'll run these public sessions where people can drop in and they can see the results. When we uh, do our facilitation, a lot of it is very visual, whether it's uh, just visual note taking or getting into more of human-centered design and design thinking tools. But there's always a lot of visual artifacts which always uh, attract people in. And for us, that's a great way to uh, document what we're doing. So we're always taking pictures. I always do a video after every session I run as a nice summary for people so that they uh, can replay everything that they've gone through because we're usually uh, doing a lot of these over multi-day sessions. So um, having a, a quick, easy way to digest it uh, for the group is very powerful and then we can reuse that in our marketing efforts to um, make everyone aware of, of not just what has happened but the value of what's happened. Uh, because you look at what uh, what four, four days of meetings get you when everyone's sitting around the table in a, in a bad meeting versus uh, everyone actively engaged, it's, it's huge difference. So uh, those visuals speak, uh, speak mountains for us. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Paulette, please, you're on the line if you would. Yes. So, so much like Brad and, and um, I love some of the ideas that Corey had as well, you know, as far as attracting our internal clients, it happens by word of mouth. Once, you, once you're able to set the example and um, show people how a, a meeting can be more effective and efficient, and they see that, uh, you know, they feel the difference, they feel energized, they walk away with exactly what they expected with something in their head, their hands and their heart, right? Um, th the word just gets out that somebody knows how to run a meeting. And that's how we attract others. People, um, as I mentioned before, our facilitators aren't just facilitators. We've taught process engineers, change managers, knowledge engineers, um, how to be better facilitators. So these guys are out there doing doing their um, their job in addition to facilitating um, the meetings. So at, while we're doing our work, we're naturally giving them this this um, best in class service as that you know as we can. So in attracting our internal clients seems somewhat easy to us, and and now that we've been practicing it for almost a year now. It seems like um, people are really starting to knock on our doors a lot more just for facilitation, even if we have nothing to do with the project that they're working on, which has been great. You know, well, that um, is, that one is of, word about that it's best, that's for sure. It is, it is. And you know, much like what um, Brad was talking about with um, showing results, it really comes with word of mouth. Um, we also conduct surveys, um, but then we also see their results as our results. So if the meeting went well and the project's going well and the project's bringing back the value it, it um, promised, then facilitation was a part of that. And a big part. And thank you, Paulette. And Preeti, if you would, would you like to close us out on this topic? Yes, thank you. Uh, so how we attract our internal clients is uh, we, we have our L&D structure, our learning and development team is structured as we have learning consultants. And uh, so there's a team of two learning consultants whose responsibility is to liaison or partner with businesses to understand their uh, you know, key goals, the challenges, help them identify gaps. And they come back to our content team where we work together to create the program. And then the program is handed over to our program managers. So they are the brand ambassadors or the owners of the program. And they work very closely with a set of learning partners who are aligned different business functions. So we have one learning partner who's aligned 
So I come from the finance industry, so there's a learning partner who's aligned to the sales function, a learning partner aligned to customer service. We have a learning partner aligned to our internal corporate functions. It's the responsibility of the learning partner together with the program owners to create visibility of the program. And then during every business reviews, our uh, you know, learning consultants are present there to educate, to hold education sessions with the business in terms of what we are doing and what are the features of these programs. That apart, we have an online community or a dashboard which we call the e-almanac where anybody can just log in and see what are the various programs that are available, what is the eligibility, what's the duration, so on and so forth. How do we go about documenting and reporting results? So we do not uh, video record the entire sessions, but we make it mandatory that when the session is on, the facilitator or the co-facilitator goes about clicking pictures and snapshots, which we post it on our internal community. That apart, we run a WhatsApp group. After every session, it's a responsibility to handhold the audience for the next 30 days through a WhatsApp group where they engage in dialogue in terms of what's going on well, what are the challenges and what have they been able to achieve. Of course, that apart, we have our facilitators, uh, UNO score, the NIS and PSAT scores. And uh, uh, th uh, three months post the program has been conducted, we drew a 360-degree survey with both the participant and the immediate managers to see what difference have they made in terms of, you know, uh, comparing with the batch which didn't go through the program versus the, the batch which, you know, took the learning program. So that's how well, we good. go about it. A nice job of documenting results, especially and I can see you're focused primarily on the learning and development piece, which is extremely helpful. Well, we have gone through, if you take a look at our four major questions, what is a master facilitator team and why have one? How do you get it approved? How do you attract and develop facilitators? How do you attract internal clients and show results? The last couple of minutes, just really before we go to questions, is to just talk about uh, how Inefac supports master facilitator teams. And so who is Inefac? As you can see, the mission there to maintain and promote um, a certification at the master level, founded in 2003, which you see on the, on the pictures there is the executive director, Seth Stephanie, and then Dr. Dows, who, Eileen Dows, who is the, the, the chair of the board for Inefac. Uh, and so there are several pieces that Inefac does have a competency model for the certified master facilitator that includes six major competencies and then 30 sub-competencies, uh, a certified master facilitator certification, the certified competent facilitator, and then a program that's relatively unique, something that's called Partners in Facilitator Development. What that's about is organizations can license the certification model. And that model supports facilitator development across four levels, apprentice, associate, accomplished, and advanced. And so if you're a partner in facilitator development, you get the competency model, as well as the role plays that are used to certify um, certified master facilitators, the scoring guide that assessors use. So actually, you can assess your own people initially as they go through the four levels, moving from apprentice, associate, accomplished, to advanced. And those who are advanced then actually can then sit for becoming certified master facilitators. Um, so get certified at the international level. And uh, in effect also provides consulting and support on your implementation of that model uh, in the, uh, the partners in facilitation development. So that's what in effect provides. Uh, also a community of practice, uh, training course accreditation where they've uh, accredited courses that have actually support the certified master facilitator model. And just a list of the current accredited courses for those who are interested, it will be in the, uh, in the results as well. Well, we have moved into Q&A. Before we do, we'd love to do that last poll. If you were going to participate virtually in a community of practice, how often would you want to meet? So think of this as the starting point, where we quickly have gone through four questions. Uh, but if we wanted to go deep, um, just spending an hour, an hour and a half on a periodic basis to go deep on a topic, the question is, how often would you want that group to meet? And so we're opening up the poll now. If you would go ahead and respond, we'll just leave it open for just a quick 30 seconds. Would you want the group to meet once a month, once every other month, once a quarter, twice a year, 
once a year. So we'll give that another 20 seconds just to see. We just want to get a feel for if we were doing this again. And the plan is to actually, in effect, wants to continue to support the development of this community of practice. And you'll have a chance in the poll to indicate, that, yes, you would like to get continued information about that. So we'll get another three, two, and one. And so you can see, I'm going to close that poll and just quickly show the results. You see that 38% said once a month, 23% once every other month, 35% said once a quarter, and uh, twice a year at 4%. And so this is information that in effect will take in and come to some conclusion and move forward. So really appreciate you participating in that. Well, it's time for us to go finally into Q&A. And just as a, so it's what additional questions do you have? And for those who are exiting out, well, we will stay on uh, for additional time, say until uh, five after the hour to take questions. And when you exit, you'll be given a survey. We really appreciate getting your feedback. You really just, uh, I believe, seven questions. And if you could answer those, those would be quick. That would be fairly quick. They're, you know, one to five type, zero rating on a one to five type scale and a, a chance for you to get some open comments as well. And for responding, you'll get a copy of these slides and the uh, white paper on internal facilitation teams. With that, we'll go to the questions. And so if you would type your question into the question panel, we'll go ahead and cover those. And panelists, if you'd like to answer the question once you heard it, that would be great. And so I'm going to questions now. And I see that, um, there we go, going there, going there. Uh, Rachel asks, will the slides be shared afterwards? I'd like to take a look at the bios again. And Rachel, Rachel yes. The uh, slides, for anyone who answers the survey, the slides would be uh, with there. Uh, several people indicated they love the timer, <laughs> and that we find that very helpful. Lori asks, is there any chance this is being recorded? Would like to share with my colleagues. In fact, the session is being recorded, and we will send out the, when we send out the information uh, about, the, uh, about the session, about the, uh, the slides, we'll also will send the link. We'll go ahead and place it up on YouTube. So you'll have, you'll have a link uh, as well um, to view the slide the slides. So again, any other questions? And I will while we're waiting for the next questions to come through, I have one for the panel as well. And um, Eric, this is really um, this is really to you. It's very impressive the things that you've been able to do. If you had one recommendation um, to people about doing this, what would you suggest? One recommendation for getting going, being successful. What might you suggest? And Eric, if you're speaking, you're probably still on mute there for us. Could you unmute? Oh, sounds like you're still mute there. I don't think I, if you would, uh, Jeremy, would you do a favor and wave at Eric for me? Just to let him know he's still on mute. We can't hear you, Eric. <laughs> yes, you're on mute is what you are. Uh, okay, so it looks like you may be on mute for more than one reason. Let me check to see if it's on our end to make sure we still can't oh, hear you. Yeah, I should be okay now. Am I all right? Yes, you are. We can hear you now. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so I was, I was just saying I, I, it's, the, it's a little a bit the Nike thing. It's like just do it. I wasn't given a budget. Uh, it, there was a problem in the organization. I think I had a, something that would help resolve that problem, and I just did it. Um, and what, I've ha what happened was it was not, I didn't get any pushback. What I got actually was a lot of support, um, and people really kind of got behind the effort. Um, and you don't have to necessarily spend a lot of money. <laughs> just, just, if, if you have experience in facilitation, just, just start to organize yourself and get going. And I think the rest kind of follows. Appreciate it. Thank you. And Charles asked, one of the panelists mentioned facilitation badges. I'd like to hear more about that. Do people actually use them? Who mentioned the badges? Uh, Michael, I did. Uh, we utilize... Can you um, yeah. Can you hear me? We sure can. All right. So, yeah, we utilize facilitation badges here at Madison College, and we have 
badges for a lot of different um, skills or, or competencies um, outside of the world of facilitation as well that you know we, we award to the community as they come through and take continuing education classes for example but also to our employees internally for things that they meet as they you know work through professional development opportunities um, and yeah quite frankly the the badges are, are something that um, I guess we just have a culture of um, utilizing those in, in a very positive way to recognize people and for the accomplishes, accomplishments that uh, that they've made. Um, I, I can't tell you a lot about the logistics or the details behind the program that awards the badges, but it, it is a, a company that uh, is outside of our organization that um, allows folks, like I said before, to, to post those externally to sites such as LinkedIn and, and other uh, social media types of, of uh, applications. Um, but the, the process for our facilitators internally to get the badges is, is um, fairly thorough. And uh, like I said, they have to show uh, examples of how they've met um, the competencies from the International Association of Facilitators um, and, and do some self-reflection on those as well. So it's, it's not just paper pushing or, or pencil pushing. Um, there's, there's, some, uh, there's some thoroughness to it, some meaningful reflection and feedback by our facilitators as well, which is really, I, to me, the, um, the, the biggest benefit, the badge is a nice bonus and a nice way to, to kind of uh, illustrate that you've gone through that process. Excellent. And uh, Charles, you may want to, on LinkedIn, just look up uh, badges, and they, you may find more information about how to bring that about. And so the last question comes from Ricardo. He asks, anything that would have been done differently? Knowing what you know now, great question, Ricardo. And I'll just go straight down the list. We'll use our alphabetical list. Um, so Brad, Corey, Eric, you'll be up first. And so uh, let me ask the three that are already on first, though. Would you do anything differently? Laura, anything that you would do differently based on what you know? Just a quick 15, 20 second answer, Laura. Anything to do differently? Uh, uh, make sure that um, all the that you get your publicity, your sponsorship, and you do great sessions. But make sure that people see it and know of it, and, and get it in a formal system also realized. There we go. Make sure people see it. Thank you. And Laura, if you could exit out, they'll make room for the next person to come in. So go for it, Tina. Anything you would do differently? I, I think. Um looking at how we grow and develop that internal capacity even more so. I really like into the models that I'm hearing of tapping into others across our campus community and how do we continue to grow and develop that. This has been as much informative for me as it has been, I hope, for others. Here we go. Brad, what do you think? And Tina, if you'd exit out, they'll make room for others. Uh, something we do, we would do differently? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Um, I, I would say it's going to be keeping that global, number one, global mindset of everything you do ha for us had to be around the world. We just had to be a local team. Uh, two is when you get, um, I think, more specific business results from people as you're preparing uh, your case, get the measurable business outcomes that you can then show the success following. Uh, not just the mile sheet, but, that, but, that, but, that, but that, the specific results. Business outcomes. Got it. Jeremy. Uh, Brad stole my answer. <laughs> I, th I think getting those specific outcomes and those results uh, in in a way that folks can appreciate what your return on investment is, for example, um, and really communicating to to the community and and for us at least internally here at the college the value that we provide, um, not only from a continued funding standpoint, but from a continued word of mouth standpoint, so people um, continue to utilize our services, but also new folks um, that maybe aren't familiar with the, the, the product that we provide and the services that we can do um, are aware of, of what's available to them. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to continue on with folks that you've already made a, an impact on, but to continue to grow and expand your reach is, is wholly another. That's the important piece. Yeah. Excellent. We'll take it there. Eric, you're up, sir. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, I'm with Jeremy and Brad in terms of what they've said. Uh, a couple things. One, I would have started sooner. Why did I wait? <laughs> there, was, there was no reason to wait. The other thing I would say in, just in, in terms of kind of assessing the value is look at the decisions that have been made by your organization. How much would 
well-facilitated meetings, discussions have helped that. Well said. Thank you. Corey, and then we'll hear from Paulette and Freedy. Corey. Yeah, I, I think all those solutions are great. The things I would underscore is that storytelling, make sure you're capturing the stories and sharing those things. Um, and for kicking it off, I'd really focus on a couple niches that have um, high value. So for us, working with customers is, is a great one because that uh, has high visibility. Nicely said. Paulette. Gosh, everything that they said is spot on. I mean, start now. Don't wait. You're going to wish you started sooner. Got it. Thank you. And Preeti, you get the last word on that. All right. Preeti, we may have lost you. Well, I'll jump right in then. Uh, so on behalf of the International Institute for Facilitation, we hope you found this extremely helpful. And what we're wanting to do is start up this community of practice in this way. And you'll be hearing more as we want to carry it forward. And based on your feedback, it will be either monthly, uh, semi-monthly, or quarterly with sessions such as this, but going deep on a specific topic. And with your suggestions through the survey, we'll know where you want it to go. With that said, please continue as we share the power of facilitation with the world. We say thank you to all of our panelists. We really appreciate your insights, powerful stuff, and look forward to seeing you all in that great facilitated session in the sky. Have a great rest of the week, everyone.